Welcome, everybody. Uh, good evening, good night, good morning, and good afternoon to everybody who joined uh, this webinar. This is a webinar jointly organized by the IPCC and the IAA, and the topic will be to introduce some of the uh, main ideas uh, and thoughts behind the paper which has been uh, published recently. Uh, which the title is a summary for actuaries uh, and the subtitle what the IPCC climate change report 2021 means for the actual profession. Uh, there will be um, a number of presentations after the introduction. So first the IPCC's Valerie Masson Delmotte will present uh, uh, a high, give a high level talk on the main messages. Uh, that are covered in the summary paper. So we call the paper uh, the long title title uh, long title uh, paper as the summary for actuaries or summary paper. Uh, then Jose Manuel Guterres will uh, talk about the interactive atlas and extreme projections. Uh, Jose is from the IPCC, and then there will be two presentations uh, from the IAA experts. Firstly, Jordanka Velich Velichkova. Uh, who will present on what the new Working Group 1 report may mean for catastrophe modeling and how risk tools used uh, by the reinsurance, insurance reinsurance industry and, and how uh, uh, the, this will be adapted uh, to uh, uh, the six assessment reports data. And finally, uh, Raid Musolin uh, will wrap up and talk about practical applications uh, of the science in practice. Uh, and then finally, we will have a, a Q&A session toward the end of this webinar. Now, some housekeep housekeeping rules, please. Firstly, this uh, webinar is being recorded. So if you do not agree that perhaps your voice, if you happen to talk, will be recorded, then you can quit uh, right now. If you agree, then, then please stay on. And now, when the webinar starts then uh, or now uh, all participants are muted centrally so you cannot interfere but when there is a the q a session toward the end of the webinar everybody will be unmuted centrally but please don't talk please raise your hand uh, you will find uh, um, the the, uh, the raise hand uh, uh, in in the in the lower part of this your screen there's a raise hand feature and then i will recognize uh, each of you uh, i see some uh, someone already tried so thank you that works um <clears throat> so i will recognize each of you in turn i'll try to keep an eye on uh, uh, uh these raised hands and uh during the presentations you may uh, share your uh views or you can ask questions in the Q&A. Uh, in, in the lower part of your screen, you see a Q&A uh, 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 sign. Also, there is a chat uh, uh, functionality available. So you can use the chat or the Q&A to communicate uh, uh, with others. Uh, <clears throat> so uh, firstly, let me uh, introduce uh, Sarah Connors, uh, who is uh, our main contact uh, uh, from the IPCC. Uh, she is the lead of the uh, summary paper from the IPCC side, and the IA side, uh, uh, Raid, uh, is the, uh, the lead uh, author of the paper. Now, Sarah is a head of science team of working group one of the IPCC. She is responsible for the delivery and coordination of science-related activities of the technical support unit of the Working Group 1 report, together with the technical support unit head, Anna Pirani. Sarah's responsibilities include uh, the line management of the Paris Science Team, as well as the technical support unit members based at the Chinese Academy of Meteorological Sciences at, in Beijing, China. Sarah supports the work of the six uh, assessment reports authors, working closely uh, together with the Working Group 1 Beer Bureau, as well as the Working Group co-chairs. So, uh, Sarah, uh, uh, could you tell us what uh, the incentives were 
for you to uh, jointly develop the summary paper for actuaries uh, to cooperate with the IAA team and to coordinate the efforts uh, from the IPCC side. So how, how did it happen from your perspective? Thank you, Gabo. Hi, everyone. It's very nice to be here today and have the opportunity to, to address you and um, discuss the, the paper that's been produced by the IAA and the IPCC. Um, so, yeah, the, the rationale for why we did this, um, I guess, at the, the beginning of the last, well, at the end of the last IPCC assessment cycle for the reports that were produced around 2013, 2014, there were a few of these so-called um, derivative products or derivative summaries that were produced, um, but these were mainly actually focused for the third working group um, report, so the one that covers mitigation aspects of, of climate change. So for this cycle, we really wanted to develop some, some more derivative products and summaries, particularly for the working group one um, report, so we could better communicate um, the key changes that are happening in terms of the physical climate changes. Um, and so when this opportunity arose, when we got, we got in contact with the IAA, we thought this was a, um, a great chance to develop a summary for the actuarial community, um, to like enable a discussion between our two communities um, and try and produce a, a document that would um, cover like the latest understanding of, of, of climate science, um, but in a useful format to um, help people who are really using climate change information um, to do risk assessment for so many different um, applications. So yeah, I really hope that the product will end up being very useful and we really encourage you to share it as much as possible. Uh, maybe we'll add a link in the chat to the, the document in case people haven't seen it already. Um, but yeah, anyway, thanks very much and I hope you enjoy the rest of the webinar. Thank you, Sarah. Um, I would add as, as uh, the host of, of the webinar from the IA side, I am uh, the chair of the Climate Risk Task Force of the IAA. And uh, two years ago, the IA decided to uh, start a, a strategic initiative uh, for the actual uh, association, the International uh, Association on, on climate risk or climate related risks. Uh, and we uh, envisaged a, a, a series of papers, uh, four, four out of the eight envisaged papers uh, have already been published, and there will be four others, but we also envisaged a close cooperation with uh, a number of uh, stakeholders that are uh, really active on on, on climate change and climate risks, uh, which is uh, then uh, which has led them to a, a good uh, contact with the IPCC uh, working group one and with Sarah and her team, uh, and we are following our uh, what our vision and missions dictate for us as actuaries in the IAA. So we would like to contribute to the global discussion on on climate related risks. Uh, and we, we think that actuaries can add value to uh, this, this global discussion. And also we would like to inform the actual profession about uh, what actuaries can do and how they can relate effectively to such very complex issues. And then the, the, the paper's uh, background is uh, uh, what's the physical uh, science behind uh, climate change and risks, uh, uh, how we can relate to that and explain to actuaries, but also non-actuaries who are interested in this topic uh, uh, to, to follow up on, on uh, similar issues. So I think this, this cooperation uh, has been very uh, productive so far. Um, and the paper uh, shows that. I've received uh, uh, some comments uh, already, very positive feedback uh, about uh, the, the paper, but uh, obviously we will publicize the paper as far as we can. At this point, I would like to give credit to the previous chair of the Climate Risk Task Force of the IAA, Micheline Dion, who started this cooperation and he, he, she hugely contributed to the uh, creation of this paper. Uh, she was elected as uh, president-elect of the IAA, so uh, a top leader, uh, and then she uh, uh, stopped uh, uh, servicing the, uh, the Climate Risk Task Force uh, by the end of last year, and I started on, on uh, 1st of January. So uh, with that introduction, I would turn to our presenters 
And so the first presenter will be uh, from the IPCC side, Valérie masson Uh Valérie is a paleoclimatologist at the Climate and Environmental Sciences Laboratory in France. She is co-chair of the IPCC Working Group 1 for its six assessment reports assessment cycle. She has served on numerous national and international projects in addition to the IPCC. Since 2014, she has been a member of the French Research Strategic Council. She has published extensively, including several books for the general public, as well as some children's books. So, Valerie, the floor is yours. Please unmute yourself and start your presentation. Thank you very much for this opportunity to share the main findings from the assessment of the state of knowledge regarding the physical changes in the climate system. And just to summarize the wealth of um, efforts that underpin such an effort, it's the work of hundreds of authors, uh, 600 contributors, um, almost 2,000 reviewers, and the authors have assessed the evidence from uh, more than 14,000 scientific publications. And this uh, body of scientific knowledge is also uh, uh, recognized uh, by all governments through an online approval process. And um, this webinar is also part of, I think, my duty to increase climate literacy, understanding the causes and understanding the implications, as well as an effort from the broad climate science community to make um, data and information broadly available so that it contributes to um, evidence-based decision-making. So the report I'm going to focus on is uh, um, the one released last summer on, on the physical science basis and the key points that are relevant for actuaries Last month, a second report was released on the other aspects um, related to impacts, adaptation, and vulnerability. And finally, last week, um, the third volume on um, options that are um, available and effective to reduce greenhouse gas emissions mitigation. And I think they might be an, an, an interest on your side for all um, these dimensions of climate change knowledge. So, the, first of all, um, what is really striking from observations, as well as evidence from paleoclimate, is that uh, recent changes in the climate are widespread, rapid, intensifying, and unprecedented in thousands of years. If we first look at changes in atmospheric composition here, we can look at the last centuries in the context of the last 800,000 years. You can see how much um, the change in greenhouse gas concentrations in the atmosphere is unprecedented. And this increase in the greenhouse effect is causing, due to human influence, a heating of the climate system. Some of the heat is driving warming of the air, melting of ice, and most of the additional heat goes into the ocean, which makes warming to date irreversible. You can also see that uh, these changes are occurring in every component of the climate system in the atmosphere with uh, warming, a warmer atmosphere can contain more moisture, shifts in circulation, um, widespread loss of the cryosphere, especially a loss of Arctic sea ice or thawing of frozen soils, shrinking of glaciers, and an acceleration in the melt of the Greenland and Antarctic ice sheets since the 1990s which is, together with ocean warming, driving an acceleration of sea level rise, one aspect of many changes in the ocean getting warmer and by absorbing a fraction of our CO2 acidifying. Multiple changes are also seen over land and it drives shifts of speeches. Half of the studied speeches worldwide are moving due to a changing climate. Many of these changes are unprecedented over long time scales. For instance, um, the rate of sea level rise now is the fastest in the past 3000 years. Ocean acidification is um, unusual in more than 2000 years. And if we focus on one key indicator of the state of the climate system, it is an indicator which is really important because many regional consequences directly scale on that indicator, the level of warming at the surface of, of the land and ocean. 
that um, the amount of warming to date reaching 1.1 degrees Celsius in the last decade compared to the late 19th century. This is unusual in more than 2000 years. We have a better understanding of human influence. This is the, an example of what we call attribution studies, simulations of global surface temperature, only accounting for natural drivers, solar and volcanic activity in green. And this is the outcome of simulations also accounting for all human activities affecting the Earth's energy budget. And you can see that it is clear from such attribution studies that um, human activities have warmed the climate system. And we have a clearer understanding of each facet of human influence. When we look at the observed warming in gray, the best estimate to date is that about 100% of the observed warming is the result of human influence with the warming effect of greenhouse gases being partly masked by the cooling effect of pollution particles. There are different characteristics for these different aspects of human influence. And if we dive a bit deeper, we can look at the relative weight of each of these drivers. So the dominant driver of warming to date and the dominant driver of future warming are past and future CO2 emissions. It has a cumulative effect, a longer lifetime in the atmosphere, and our emissions of CO2 affect plants through the concentration in the atmosphere and affect the chemistry of the ocean due to acidification. The second main driver are our emissions of methane. Methane is a powerful but short-lived greenhouse gas, a, a, a lifetime in the atmosphere of around 10 years. It leads through atmospheric chemistry to the formation of surface ozone, another greenhouse gas, and an atmospheric pollutant. So when we account for these two effects, methane is the second main driver, and future methane emissions will be critical for near-term warming. When we look at the understanding of the role of human influence, you can see that it's the main driver of many of the changes I've described previously. It's also a contributor to many other changes, in addition to the role of natural climate variability. When we look at the interplay between warming and natural variability, we see that novel climate conditions, changes are increasingly apparent above past natural variations, also at regional scales. And in fact, the human driven signal has emerged from natural variability earlier in tropical regions. Warming is lower, but variability is lower. And it has emerged more recently in high latitudes where warming is larger, but natural variability as well. A novel aspect of uh, um, the physical understanding is the understanding of how human influence on the global climate system is also affecting extreme events and uh, its key role in the intensification of hot extremes, heavy rainfall events, and in some regions, droughts. It is illustrated here through a map with each region being an hexagon. For instance, you can see um, North Central America here. And um, for all areas that appear in red, we detect uh, an intensification of hot extremes and the number of dots reflect uh, the um, level of confidence in the weight of human influence in this observed intensification. You can see that it's widespread. In many regions, we also see that intensification for extreme rainfall events, it's the result of a warmer atmosphere that can hold about 7% more moisture per degree of warming. In many tropical regions, in many developing countries, we have a lack of availability of long records or a lack of attribution studies. And therefore they appear here in gray due to a lack of studies or accessibility of data sets. For agricultural drought, droughts associated with soil moisture, in several regions of Mediterranean climate, we observe an intensification of those droughts 
And the human influence is particularly strong in um, the West North American region and around the Mediterranean Sea. And this results from a tendency to have less annual mean rainfall, plus the warming effect, increasing evaporation and transpiration, enhancing soil moisture droughts. So as you can see, every region is affected by multiple changes, gradual ones, changes in the frequency and intensity of extreme events, including a decrease in the frequency of cold extremes, compound events such as dry and hot conditions leading to fire weather are increasing in duration, areas affected, and severity. Multiple changes are affecting the ocean, warming, a loss of oxygen because the ocean mixes less well, an increased um, acidification of the ocean. This affects marine ecosystems. It has already led to a decline in fisheries outcomes in the tropical regions. And it also affects ecosystems such as coral reef degradation. Let's look now at the future. And a, a strong message from this report is that unless there are rapid and large scale reductions in greenhouse gas emissions, limiting warming to uh, close to 1.5 degrees Celsius or well below two degrees, the goals of the Paris Agreement will be beyond reach. Future changes are approached by five illustrative scenarios used to drive global climate modeling. They span a broad range of possible futures. Very high emission scenarios are now less plausible due to climate policies at play and also um, cheap low carbon electricity that is now available. Um, current pledges from governments, if all implemented, could uh, imply a small decline in global greenhouse gas emissions by 2030. We also explore uh, scenarios with low or very low greenhouse gas emissions with much faster declines um, and uh, reaching net zero emissions by 2050 or 2070. This is important because we show that when we reach net zero CO2 emissions, there's almost no more warming coming. So it's really the amount of CO2 emissions that will dominate long-term warming until net zero CO2 is reached. And this is illustrated here by the outcome of uh, future temperature assessments. It is the result of global climate models constrained by observations and constrained by our understanding of feedbacks from process understanding and information from past climates. So we have a narrower uncertainty compared to previously. We show that in the near term, in all cases, even with very ambitious reductions of greenhouse gas emissions, we expect the level of global warming to reach around 1.5 degrees Celsius in the next 20 years. We see that by the mid of the century, uh, warming could stabilize below two degrees Celsius with um, ambitious action to reduce greenhouse gas emissions, or a level of warming of two degrees could be reached. And if emissions don't decrease, then it is uh, possible to uh, also reach a range of warming between 2 and 3.5 degrees Celsius by the end of the century, the intermediate scenario. So as a function of the level of global warming, every further increment of warming will affect um, climate characteristics in every region, mean climate conditions, as well as the occurrence of extreme events. In this report, we have identified uh, the main characteristics that scale with the level of global warming. So it's the case for changes in regional mean temperature here compared to the late 19th century where future changes in every region will increase with the level of global warming. It's also the case for changes in precipitation in annual mean with wetter annual mean conditions in uh, cold regions some intensification of monsoons, but with a complex pattern because it will also depend on local emissions of pollution particles that we call aerosols. In regions with a Mediterranean type climate, you can see a projection of a decrease in annual mean precipitation 
that increases with every increment of warming. And as a result, the mean soil moisture shows a decline in many regions, increasing with the level of warming. It's the case in Central America, in South America, South Africa, areas of Australia and Asia, and in Europe and around the Mediterranean Sea. So this is a gradual trend in soil moisture, which has implications for forests or for um, um, uh, agricultural activities as well. So a, a very important finding um, is that further warming intensifies the global water cycle and its variability, which means more frequent and more intense wet and dry events, wet and dry seasons. One example of a, a synthesis of information that is available in the paper is how storms are changing with further warming. Uh, for um, uh, tropical cyclones, extra tropical cyclones, and atmospheric river events, um, there's a strong signal for an increase in rainfall amounts and precipitation rates with warming. For tropical cyclones, we already observe an increase in the uh, uh, strongest category cyclones. And for future uh, warming, we expect a, a further increase in the strengths of the most severe cyclones but uh, a decreased or an unchanged frequency of occurrence altogether. And uh, uh, finally, um, this is a summary that many of the changes become more intense, more frequent, uh, in direct relation to the level of global warming. Let's take the example of heat waves that occurred once in 50 years in pre-industrial conditions. They are already five times more likely to occur. And you can see that this um, probability of occurrence doubles uh, for a world 1.5 degrees warmer, so in the next 20 years. And their intensity also increases faster than the global average. It's amplified in cities due to um, heat island effects. Um, the shrinking of the Arctic sea ice, especially in summer, of snow cover, especially in spring, and uh, the thaw of frozen soils also scales directly with global warming. So a core message is that um, in order to uh, prepare for the changes, the changes in hazards, we provide in this report information regarding the magnitude, the frequency, the new locations or the different timing or new combinations of rare events that are expected to occur um, with a further warming in the coming decades. And this information, of course, can be included in risk assessments so as to reduce um, the severity of consequences. We provide a framework of 33 climatic impact drivers ranked in these broad characteristics. And an important message is that every region will increasingly experience concurrent and multiple changes in these physical characteristics, trends, extremes, events, events uh, associated with a known tolerance thresholds, for instance, for human health or for crop production. If warming reaches two degrees by 2050, 96% of regions will uh, face changes in at least 10 of these characteristics. And for half of the regions, it will be 15 of these characteristics. I want to add one point. In the past, one of the main natural driver of uh, forced climate variability was the occurrence of major volcanic eruptions. You can also see in our report that a major volcanic eruption in the coming years or decades is likely. And you can also find a description of the known possible implications in addition to human driven trends. We provide two page regional fact sheets um, to know uh, very quickly, what are the main characteristics of a changing climate in, in broad regions? And data are accessible through our online interactive atlas uh, that will be presented next. One example here is the change in the number of days where maximum temperature is above 35 degrees Celsius, so a critical threshold associated with uh, uh, effects on mice yields. And you can see how much different amounts of global warming imply a longer duration above that threshold and implications that can be extremely um, important in terms of food security. 
for some aspects, there's no going back. The warming to date, the response of the glaciers that take decades to adjust, the deep ocean, hundreds of years, the Greenland and Antarctic ice sheets, hundreds to thousands of years. In the near term, we provide the best estimate of future global mean sea level, sea level rise. And you can see that it does not much depend until 2050 on the emissions scenarios. We also show how much the rate of sea level rise after 2050 will depend on future greenhouse gas emissions. And from a request from uh, those involved in critical coastal infrastructure, we also provide a quantification of uh, uh, the maximal plausible um, sea level rise during this century in the case of very high CO2 emissions. If, uh, ice sheet instability processes associated with deep uncertainty are triggered. And we also provide this information over time scales of hundreds of years in the future. It is sometimes relevant for critical coastal infrastructure as well. Relative sea level rise in different regions is something really important regarding its implications for the recurrence and intensity of coastal flooding as well as coastal erosion along sandy coasts. And the NASA has also an online resource showing the projections, not as shown here for global mean sea level rise, but also regional uh, sea level rise that can be important for coastal risk assessment. Of course, we can slow these long-term changes or slow onset events, and we can stop those that directly uh, are linked to the level of global warming by limiting warming. We confirm a, a direct relationship between the cumulative amount of CO2, past, present, and future emissions, and the level of global warming. This is also translated in remaining carbon budgets to limit warming at 1.5 or 2 degrees levels, uh, reflecting the goals of the Paris Agreement, for instance. The implication is that to limit global warming, it is critical to reduce CO2 emissions and reach with the lowest possible amount, net zero CO2 emissions resulting from human activities. So this is a key condition to limit long-term warming. And it is illustrated here by showing the effect over a hundred years of a pulse of emissions from human activities today. And you can see that on a time scale of 100 years, it is dominated by CO2 emissions. So it stops when we reach net zero. But if we look at a time scale of around 10 years, you can see that there's a cooling effect of the short-lived pollution particles that are emitted also when we use fossil fuels. And there's a strong warming effect on the near term due to emissions of methane. And this shows that to limit warming in the near term, to uh, co compensate uh, losing the cooling effect of pollution particles that are co-emitted with CO2, reducing methane emissions is critical to limit near-term warming. And this would not just be beneficial for climate, uh, but it could also improve air quality, pollution particles on one side, uh, and ozone um, on the other side are two uh, types of pollutants that are uh, toxic for human health. If we strongly reduce emissions, the effect of, on atmospheric composition, air quality, uh, would occur really quickly within a few years. It's illustrated here by looking at the CO2 concentration between low and high emission scenarios. And you can see a quick divergence for CO2 concentration. In terms of global surface temperature trends, accounting for year-to-year -year variability linked to the occurrence of El Nino events, you can see that the difference would be discernible within about 20 years. So this illustrates how much the climate we experience in the future depends on our decisions. Now with inertia of infrastructure that plays a key role, it's not the inertia of the climate system, it's really the inertia of heavy emitting infrastructure. And it also shows the advances in providing actionable climate information at the regional scale that is uh, crucial to limit uh, 
the risks associated with a changing climate. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Valerie. Um, so there is no time now to ask questions uh, or make any other contributions. So let's turn to the other presentation. And then at the end of the webinar, we will have some time saved for uh, questions and answers. Thank you very much for those who have already submitted some questions and contributions. So the next speaker will be Jose Manuel Guterres to talk about the inter interactive atlas. Uh, and the extreme projections. Jose is the director of the Institute of Physics of Cantabria at the University of Cantabria, Spain. He was coordinating lead authors in the working group one contribution to the IPCC's six assessment report and led on the working group one interactive atlas, a novel aspect of uh, this report. He wor his works uh, are committed to making research data adhere to the fair, accessible, interoperable, and reusable uh, principles. So, Jose, the floor is yours. Please go ahead. Hello, my name is Jose Manuel Gutierrez, and I'm one of the coordinating lead authors of the Atlas chapter, and also of the Interactive Atlas which uh, I'm glad to introduce in this uh, presentation of the summary for actuaries. Well, the Interactive Atlas is a novel tool for flexible spatial and temporal analysis of both observed and projected climate change information underpinning the assessment report. So the information that Valerie just described in the previous talk. So you can see the landing page of the interactive atlas with the different components that, that I will describe in this presentation and the link uh, to access the, the product. Well, this uh, interactive atlas uh, has been implemented to allow transparent uh, access to data and also to code facilitating the reproducibility and also the reuse of the information uh, which can be accessed uh, using the interactive atlas. And this was part of, uh, of the efforts done in this uh, assessment re report to implement FAIR principles. Uh, this effort was coordinated by the Working Group 1 Technical Support Unit and overseen by TG Data. And uh, these efforts include uh, the archival of uh, curated data uh, undertaken by the IPCC Data Distribution Center, the intermediate uh, uh, and data set uh, underpinning the interactive atlas is part of this curated data, data sets to be archived. Uh, so you can you can see here the, the landing page of the IPCC data distribution center with information on the data archive for AR6 for the three working group working groups. And also you can find there a catalog where you can look for uh, keywords uh, uh, Using keywords, uh, you can look for specific data sets. So this is, for instance, uh, the result of a search for SPM, summary for policymaker uh, information. So you can find there the data for the figures. So another effort is the code and data repositories. It have repositories provided by the um, uh, managed, uh, sorry, by the technical support unit. And this is uh, an example of the repository for the Atlas, where you can find, uh, for instance, notebooks to reproduce some of the results which are displayed in the interactive Atlas. And there are other tools, other data tools, which are described in the Annex 1 of this uh, summary for actuaries. So regarding the interactive Atlas, as I already mentioned, uh, the the goal of this tool is supporting the assessment done in the chapters and also in the technical summary and the summary for policymakers. And uh, it has a regional focus. Uh, so it provides uh, both global and regional information, but uh, for the regional, uh, for a number of predefined regions. So those are the regions used in the report, basically the reference regions, monsoons, small islands, major river basins, and so, and so on. So the, the interactive atlas has two main components. The, the first one, regional information, uh, provides information, uh, plots, uh, maps, time series, 
for multiple variables and indexes from global and regional observational data sets and also model projections. This includes the global CMIP 5 and 6 and also the regional Cordex uh, projections. So uh, with this tool, you can typically display uh, the, the kind of maps, uh, pro projections for near term in this case, which are included, for instance, in the, in the summary. This is figure eight from the summary. A number of ind indexes displaying changes uh, in the near term in the in a high emission scenario, for instance. So this uh, this kind of uh, products can be obtained for a number of atmospheric variables, uh, essential climate variables, temperatures, precipitation, snowfall, and wind. Uh, also, some oceanic sea surface temperature, sea ice, pH, and sea level rise and some other socioeconomic uh, uh, indexes uh, such as population or CO2 emissions, just to provide context on the scenarios which are used in the projections. So, and uh, furthermore, apart from the, um, from the raw variables, the interactive factors include a number of extreme indexes, for instance, annual, um, annual maximum temperature, uh, the number of days with the annual maximum temperature uh, over uh, a particular threshold, 35 or 40 degrees, um, heating degree days, uh, in heavy precipitation is the maximum one day precipitation, consecutive dry days, and so on. So the, the interactive factors includes uh, around 30 different uh, variables and indexes, which are used in the different chapters, for instance, the extremes are used in chapter 11, 12 and the atlas to provide uh, assessment uh, information in the in the report. So we are in the atlas supporting and extending that information. So those indexes can be this can be analyzed using the different uh, climate dimensions. And uh, this is implemented in two interfaces, a simple one. Uh, oriented to decision makers, media and teaching with uh, simple choices. So basically this simple interface, which is labeled as climate futures, uh, provides projected changes for global, global warming levels. So you can just see changes for 1.5, 2, 3 and 4 degrees, uh, global warming levels. Uh, in this case for precipitation, mean precipitation, uh, this is uh, in as percentage. And uh, you can also obtain regional information just by clicking on a particular uh, region and uh, obtaining um, standard visualizations such as time series, tabular information, and so on. So this simple interface is just oriented to uh, global warming levels. But uh, uh, an advanced interface uh, provides further options and further choices. So this is uh, targeted to scientists and practitioners who can better uh, make decisions on the choices, for instance, the periods uh, across the scenarios, the different scenarios to be used relative to different baselines. So they can better manage different choices to make sense of this climate dimension in terms of periods across different uh, global, uh, uh, sorry, uh, emission uh, scenarios, climate change scenario. And uh, uh, the interactive factors includes also observed trends and paleoclimate information, which can, can be also checked in this advanced uh, interface. So this is the landing page of the interactive atlas displaying uh, global results. This, for instance, is heavy precipitation, a particular index. Uh, so green is uh, intensifying uh, as a percentage, and the brown is, uh, is uh, decreasing uh, heavy precipitation. So uh, the main window, the different tabs allow to uh, make choices, for instance, changing the variable. We can change, we can select uh, across the different variables and indexes that I just illustrated. So the, for instance, the maximum of maximum temperatures, this would be the, the, the result. And uh, the, the interactive factors allows exporting the figures, so you can using this button in the toolbar, in the toolbar, one of the buttons allows exporting the figures as bitmap, but also the underlying data in GeoTIFF and the NetCDF formats, various formats for different purposes. And uh, 
again, by clicking in a particular region, uh, a number of visualizations can be displayed. And those can, this is, for instance, for the Mediterranean, uh, the annual maximum temperatures, again, and those, again, uh, can be uh, exported using the, the the tools, the buttons uh, uh, in the in the main window. So this is a, a, a different view, seasonal stripes instead of using the standard MCD. So there are a number of choices that uh, you can explore uh, using the interactive atlas. So the second component, the regional synthesis, uh, provides regional information relevant for impacts and risk assessment for a number of categories. So this is synthesis information from a number of uh, lines of evidence, literature, the indexes that we, we just, we just uh, illustrated in the regional information component for a number of categories such as heat and cold, wet and dry, wind, snow and ice, coastal, open ocean. So um, um, the, this, uh, this synthesis information is based on a number of climatic impact drivers, which are physical climate system conditions, means, extremes, events that affect an element of society or an ecosystem. So the, the assessment report provided the synthesized information of observed trends with attribution and also future changes um, for, for a period corresponding to a two degrees global warming level. Uh, so, and this was done at a regional level, so for the different regions. So, this table, table three of the of the summary, includes a number of CIDs, climatic impact drivers, for the different categories: heat and cold, and wet and dry. Displayed here, the table is larger, uh, and the CIDs include for heat and cold, mean air temper temperature, but also extreme heat, cold spell, frost, and so on. And those CIDs are uh, summarized for the different regions in columns, Mediterranean, Western Europe, and so on. So there are a number of tables in the report uh, summarizing observed trends and future changes. And the interactive atlas allows to explore this information via the regional synthesis component uh, and uh, using uh, different uh, graphical and, uh, and tabular uh, forms. So this is, for instance, a figure, again, from the summary, uh, which has been obtained from the interactive atlas. So the interactive atlas uh, includes three, uh, three options. The first one is displaying the changes. So these are projections. Purple means increasing. And, uh, and the brown means decreasing, and the, and the intensities uh, indicate high confidence or medium confidence. So those are the uh, projected changes for one of the CIDs, aridity, from the wet and dry category. So you can, we can see that the, the aridity is, uh, is decreasing in northern regions where precipitation is increasing, for instance, and is, uh, and, uh, is, and is increasing, uh, so it's more arid uh, climates for the future in regions like the Mediterranean. So this same uh, information can be visualized for other CIDs, for instance, heavy precipitation and uh, pluvial flooding. So it's uh, increasing in most of the cases with uh, high or medium, for instance, in the Mediterranean confidence. and uh, uh, the, the atlas also display uh, past trends, information on past trends. This information can be visualized in, in the form of tabula, tables with the tabular information, future changes and trends and attribution. And there is also um, a, a final uh, uh, option, which is combinations where users can combine different CIDs, aridity, hydrological drought, uh, agricultural and ecological drought, and fair weather to obtain a customized uh, visual, uh, visualization of how different CIDs are changing in the different regions. So thank you very much for the attention. And uh, I conclude with the key links of the presentation, which are displayed in this slide. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Jose. Um, we are uh, going to the next part of our other uh, webinar. So uh, it will be about uh, 
what the facts and uh, and uh, and the uh, assumptions are, are on the future uh, that come from the the physical science uh, will mean for the actual profession or some aspects how actuaries can relate to all these uh, uh, facts and 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 potential scenarios in the future. So I guess uh, what actuaries are mostly in, interested, it's not just uh, uh, a, a, an increased uh, level of frequency and severity, but uh, the variability of, of the distribution. And that's where perhaps catastrophes play a role. So the next speaker of uh, from the IA side, Jordanka Velichkova, will present on uh, what the new Working Group One report may mean for catastrophe modeling and how risk tools used by the insurance reinsurance industry will adopt uh, to incorporate uh, the results and the data in the six uh, assessment report. So, Jordanka is employed by Swiss Re. He is a CAT Perils and Cyber Team. Inter he is the CAT Perils and Cyber Team interface to international, internal and international stakeholders uh, as the underwriting and risk management, uh, as well as an external stakeholders uh, such as regulators, investors, on the topics of uh, net netcat underwriting, netcat portfolio performance and state-of-the-art process governance. Her team is responsible for embedding macro trends such as climate change and urbanization in the NATCAT underwriting processes of C3. So Jordanka, please uh, go ahead, the floor is yours. Good afternoon, good morning, good evening to everyone. Um, do you hear me? Do you see the slides that I'm sharing? Yes. Yes. Really well. I want to make them full screen. Yes, that's what I'm trying to do, but it's not working. It worked earlier in the preparation. Let me pause share and I do a new share. Still not full screen? No, but you can go ahead. Okay. Um, and it is. So it's a pleasure to be here today. Um, I'm going to discuss how the IPCC 6 report and the summary of actuaries informs the NATCAT modeling and share the perspective of a global reinsurance company. Swiss Re, um, climate, when we speak about climate change, it is relevant for Swiss Re for both sides of its balance sheet, the liabilities and the assets, and also our own operations. Today I'm going to represent and talk about from the physical climate change perspective and really the property not cut line of business, which is a very um, narrow um, um, implication of what, what these topics is about and how it concerns us. Swiss Re is one of the um, few reinsurance companies that uh, have an own proprietary NATCAT modeling team. So for us, it's quite relevant, the science that's being produced and is the result, um, the work of um, so many scientists across the globe. We maintain approximately 190 risk views and models across the globe, which covers more than 90% of all the insured exposures. And uh, it's a team of approximately 40 plus scientists. Um, the result of what we have today and how we deploy capacity on a global basis is the result of a concentrated investment over the last 20, 30 years. So when we speak of, it's not even moving, resume share. My slides are not even moving. I'm not sure what you see actually. Uh, Maybe well, we can see the title. The title slide only, so. Yes, but now it, it froze. I cannot move to the next. Slide. Okay, this is Christian. Let me take over and I'll, I'll run yes, the slides please. for you. Then indicate to Christian when uh, he advances the slides, so. Yeah, so maybe now directly if, when you manage, if you could go to slide three, please. So when we speak of natural catastrophes, and recently there has been a publication of Swiss Re, we call these sigmas. There we um, talk about how much of, um, expect how much losses do we see um, globally. We see that 2021 is the fourth year um, on record, the costliest year from an insurance perspective. And we also see that after a relatively quiet period within 2012 to 2016, the growth of NATCAT losses is back to its uh, long-term trend of five to 7%. Today, if we look at 10 year average of that insured loss amount, we are approximately um, 10 times higher than 30 years ago. 
And within that mix of insured losses, secondary perils play quite a substantial role. Over the long term, what we observe, they are approximately 56% of that total. But more recently, the last two years at least, these represent 70% um, of the insured losses. I mentioned the secondary perils. Um, and that's a term to differentiate more on a relative basis to what we would call primary perils, basically the, the hurricanes, tropical cyclones, earthquakes, where there's a potential um, to have a big capital event or let's say the solvency of the insurance industry could be threatened. And this, by secondary perils, we rather mean these the smallish events on a relative basis, again, that uh, occur relatively more frequently. And these are the ones where climate change has quite some relevance. So for the last two, three years, we start talking a little bit more explicitly about these perils. And if you move to the next slide, please. This is a short summary of how the year 21, in terms of natural catastrophes, compares to pre previous year and also to the average of the last five years or the long-term average of 20 years. In 21, there was, there's one big event that uh, contributes the majority of that, 111 billion insured losses, and that would be Hurricane Ida with approximately 30 billion of insured loss. But we saw also for the first time, two of these secondary peril events um, that we, the floods in Germany and also the winter storm Uri in the US where we saw an industry loss, in short industry loss of above 10 billion and jointly those just three events, uh, we have more than 50% of the insured loss of last year. If you move to the next slide, please. When we think about these insured losses and why are they rising, um, there are different drivers at play and it's really these complex uh, dynamics of um, many um, influencing elements and the climate change and the natural variability, what is the scope and what we talk today and in relevance to the IPCC reports is um, definitely one of the drivers and an area we are looking into. I have this longer list here more to emphasize and highlight um, that there are also other elements at play. And then I think most of you would be familiar when we speak economic development or concentration of assets in exposed areas. So the two pictures of Shanghai, 30 years ago and today, uh, they all already show that even in the absence of climate change or anything that we have heard being spoken today that is quite real, it would be quite natural we see higher um, losses simply by how our economy is developing. Other drivers for these rising insured losses would be um, take-up rates, insurance coverage. We have these elements of socioeconomic inflation or regulatory changes. The changing vulnerability is an interesting one because there we have um, drivers that can go in both directions. On one hand side, sealing of services or overbuilding in flood prone areas is a driver that makes the risk bigger. On the other hand side, if we think of flood protection measures or stronger building codes um, being enforced, et cetera, that would be um, a risk, a driver that actually would be reducing um, the riskiness of the landscape and the losses. And maybe if you can move to the next uh, slide. I have now then two sections. I split a bit the time horizon into today and the future. And I will tell you why from a um, natural catastrophe modeler. Most of them, when we speak property not cut line of business, most of the contracts, both on the reinsurance side, but also insurance would, be, would have a short term duration. So they have this annual renewal cycle, or even if they're longer term would be let's say three to five years. So it's quite important that we look at what is the climate today and what are the risk drivers today? So this is the one part that I will touch upon here. And then the next, which has this stronger link to the um, longer term horizon and what we hear from the scientists about the different scenarios would be the 2050. And I speak about that uh, later. So in terms of what IPCC report tells us, um, these four bullet points, they absolutely don't do justice to what we've heard or what one can read in all the material. I would like to focus more on the not cut modelers view when interpreting these tre trends and making them practicable and usable for underwriting decisions today. So the first important thing is that current state of climate, uh, when we speak of the different perils we're talking or trying to model, modeling um, the frequency and severity 
we need to reflect that current state of climate and it's a little bit to a less relevance, whether it's a natural variability or it's the anthropogenic climate change that drives that. Drives that. So even if one cannot fully precisely allocate amidst all the uncertainties, it is important we capture um, the frequencies today. All the variety of the loss drivers that I mentioned before, these should not be neglected. And um, when benchmarking model performance or making underwriting decisions, another item that's relevant is that we correct for trends in the historical data or the points that we use to benchmark. And this is something our internal lingo would be um, the biasing. So one aspect would be, um, let's say the climate is today, climate different from before or longer term period, but others would be, has something changed in the insurance penetration, as I said, or is there, an external driver that would make, let's say, the last five years that we, we look at that a little bit more representative than the last 30. But from a NATCA, they're more broadly speaking, the longer um, we have as um, period we are looking at, the more data points, the better. And if you move to the next slide, please. And I have an example of um, a few features of um, the tropical cyclone North Atlantic probabilistic model, um, Swiss Re will have a new model to be released in the coming um, weeks, months. And um, this is not meant to be a, um, let me show you everything about our model, but really I have picked up a few features that focus on, on the different macro risk drivers that we, are, uh, we have um, intentionally studied and made sure they're incorporated. On the left-hand side, there are the so-called climate related, um, where um, we have really looked at increased frequency of uh, the warmer phase that uh, we have now in the North Atlantic. That's something we've had in our model since um, for the last 15, 20 years. But during this um, review round and build up, we have also made sure that uh, what we learn now from the latest, the IPCC reports and also in collaboration with scientists, we've had um, Professor Adam Sobel from Columbia University to have um, an external scientific stamp that the way we model and account for um, the hazard and the event is um, it, it's, it's the best way we can factor in today's climate. We also have um, explicitly considering the TC induced flooding. So as seen in Hurricane Harvey, that's also a, an area where climate change has an impact. And by having that built in our model, we make sure that we capture the correlation between the flooding, the rainfall that comes with hurricanes um, in one model. The current level of uh, sea level rise is another aspect we have considered. And on the, the right hand side are more these other macro trends um, like changes in building codes or urbanization factors. The fact that you have this redistribution more moving to the coast or in more exposed areas as well as social claims inflation effects that was seen in Florida post hurricane um, Irma. And if you move to the next slide, please. It's um, here, please don't try to read everything that's written here. It's a bit of zooming out of the modeling. So what I am describing here on the left, these cat perils, this is the team I'm part of, um, the, the, the team building the natural catastrophe models globally. Um, all these climate change effects and different trends um, are captured in the what is usually called the four box model. You have the hazard, vulnerability, exposure data, financial model. We have a model there, then these models are being passed on, so to say, to the underwriting community um, that are using them. Then this same, the, the outcome of that is aggregated by um, a function we have internally called business steering, and then this is being passed on to risk management. So the, the work that that Perils team does and consideration of all these relevant trends flows through all the underwriting decisions that we make and flows into the solvency capital calculations and really how the Swiss re perform. So it's, um, it, there's a lot of accountability and responsibility there. And these purple dots, if you wonder what these are, it's an attempt to show in which parts of the model building process we can reflect the different trends that influence. So the climate change should be part of the, um, the hazard. And then this is this long-term um, trend. And I would like to point out, for example, in underwriting, since to build a probabilistic model, it usually takes one, two to three years, depending on complexity, et cetera. And sometimes there are trends that would have be rather of a um, temporary nature. Let, let's say now this is a supply chain shock, 
with inflation and we make sure that our underwriting community will take a model and then know what is in there and then they do an extra loading or adjustment to reflect um, other trends that uh, could not be um, built and could not uh, fit into a model like that. And maybe with this, I could go to the next part of the presentation where I focus on the long-term and the future. So that, that's a quote now from the report that the past does not appropriately represent the future. I mentioned that how we take risk decisions today and underwrite, we focus on the current climate, but at the same time, we also look at the um, longer term horizon, 2050. Um, here, an immediate question might be, why not 110? So all that science and all that research has a little bit longer term horizon. But what we are attempting with risk management and in our team is that we try to create analytics that are useful for making business decisions and strategic decisions today. And anything longer than 2050, it starts building quite some uncertainty um, that it becomes very difficult to translate to underwriting decisions today. Again, on the left-hand side, four bullet points summarizing the IPCC reports, um, fully insufficient, but just an attempt to show then on the right-hand side, these are the questions we pose to ourselves. And um, for those interested, our recent uh, climate-related financial disclosures that in the, our recent TCFD report, uh, what I'm going to present now, it's uh, explained in quite some detail. When we approach that analytics and what the future can tell us, those were the questions we tried to ask ourselves. So are there hotspots today that we cannot underwrite any longer? Do our costing underwriting practices capture uh, materialized climate change effects today? Do we need to change our risk appetite going forward? Do we have to change something um, in our risk taking? Do we have the right risk management? And um, the next slide is um, analysis we did on um, TC Japan. If you could maybe move to the next slide. It's um, there are numbers here shown for um, tropical cyclone Japan. We did a very similar, um, similar looking chart, just different numbers for tropical cyclone North Americas as well. Those two um, weather perils are um, the largest on our nut cut exposure. So from a group perspective, we in this pilot study that we did, we focused on the risks that would have the most material effect within our uh, property nut cut book. And, you see here, you'd recognize the lingo and one small typo. RC, we use the RCP and not the um, SSP. The reason is we did that work um, early in 2021. So what we analyzed is we took a market portfolio and we said, okay, for a global um, reinsurer like Swiss Re, it's representative enough of the dynamics. And then we tried to isolate the climate change effects and kept everything else constant. So I was telling you of that economic development, changes in building costs, et cetera. We, we really kept all other risk drivers fixed so that we see what can happen. And here we worked with the um, transition mechanism, very simply put, um, when the physical climate change, it impacts the frequency severity of apparel, then risk translates with increased damages, and then that translates into higher uh, property insured loss. And what we did is we've taken, um, let's say in the case of tropical um, cyclones and also in hurricanes, we've taken the um, parameters for TC frequency um, changes, the rain, the intensities, the rain rates, and also the category four, five intensification. And we have tried to feed that through our models. So what these results show, maybe how to read the coloring. The, um, so the first, we looked at annual expected loss and then also in the loss frequency curve, how would the 200 event change? So if we focus on the annual expected losses, the two blue bars, um, we looked at the most extreme strongest warming scenario and we have one A and one B. The difference between two, these two is that the one B would take the median values in the for the um, items we were um, parameterizing for, and the 1A is taking the, the most extreme values. And the outcome was that if we are not in this the most extreme, so you take the worst, worst, worst case scenario, as long as one works with median values and the horizon of 2050, there's quite some overlap between the different scenarios and results are quite 
similar, and we see an increase of expected loss of 9%. If you simply divide by 30 years time horizon we are looking at, this translates into quite digestible changes year on year. And then we said, is this big, is this small enough? So we compare to um, that growth in nut cut losses that uh, I've presented at the beginning of presentation. And if we take the GDP, um, the economic development away to compare and see what the change would be there. And then the number on a global basis, it's approximately 3%, and that's quite bigger than the 0 0.6 here. So the result of that analysis we did, which uh, basically stopped at this annual expected loss and loss frequency curve was that it, it confirms that we should continue on the path and what we are doing today, apply latest science, study all the risk trends and make sure we make uh, solid underwriting decisions globally. And this brings me to um, the last slide. And uh, as a key takeaways, um, for us, the IPCC reports, this is the authority on climate change. That's where we learn from, what we try to incorporate in our models and underwriting decisions. While we diligently study these climate change effects, we pay attention to the other uh, macro risk drivers as well, because in the near term and today, they, they have quite, um, quite some big impact. And um, when we look at the longer term horizon, uh, we attempt that our analytics are answering the right question so that it's not analysis for the sake of analysis, but rather how do we ensure our senior management that um, NATCAT is, um, is an area we, um, we want to play with. And um, it's, a, it's a place for Swiss Re to continue uh, providing risk transfer and have an impact on the global uh, society. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jordanka. Um, let's turn to the next presentation. We are a, a, a bit late on our timing, but uh, Reid is a very experienced presenter, so he will be very uh, uh, yeah, to, the, to the topic. So Reid Musolin will be the next speaker, the last speaker on behalf of the IAA, uh, and talking about you know, practical applications. Uh, uh, Reid is a, a, the chair of the IAA's uh, Resource and Environment uh, Virtual Forum, and also a member of the Climate Risk Task Force. He's employed as a principal at Finity Consulting based in Sydney, Australia. He is a US trained actuary and has 40 years uh, experience in general insurance specializing, particularly in property pricing, natural perils, uh, um, reinsurance mutuals, uh, catastrophe risk modeling, and obviously climate risk. His main areas of interest include how changing population demographics affect catastrophe exposure, climate change adaptation, and uh, similar. So, Raid, please uh, go ahead with your presentation. Thank you, Gabor. And I just want to verify that you can see my presentation and that you can hear me. Yes? Yes. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Okay, well, I'm going to try to um, bring the presentations back to um, sort of the reality of um, working as an actuary in climate and talk a little bit about how we try to make this, uh, this science uh, real to people who we deal with our clients and our stakeholders. I think the first thing for actuaries, like many professions, it's gonna require a new way of thinking, not again, not just for actuaries, but for lawyers and for uh, you know, everybody else, public policymakers, et cetera. And on the right, I've listed some ways that uh, we have to change. You know, our basic education does not currently have a lot of content on climate risk. Uh, we've got to use different skills. You know, we usually as actuaries torture the data until it confesses. Um, in climate, we've got to understand natural perils, macroeconomics, and a whole range of new skills. We've got to work on multidisciplinary teams. We've got to use a lot of data that's external to the uh, organizations we work for. Change occurs at warp speed, and uncertainty is much higher than we're commonly used to dealing with. I think the first step in the process is learning the lexicon and trying to understand uh, a new language, uh, which is very different from the math and statistics that most of our uh, actuarial uh, people have been versed in throughout their careers. And uh, that includes learning acronyms like RCPs and SSPs and learning uh, like, you know, think terms like adaptation or carbon footprints or how to measure uh, carbon. 
uh, in, in, in ways that are different than the normal financial metrics we usually use. And uh, a good place to start is in the glossaries. And the report that we're talking about today has a, a good glossary in Annex 2. And the uh, actuarial papers uh, that we've talked about from the Climate Risk Task Force also have a, a good glossary where you can start to learn the lexicon. I think the key concepts really for actuaries are, to me are confidence and likelihood. And the IPCC report spends a good bit of time uh, uh, discussing various climate uh, effects in terms of the confidence, which is a qualitative measure of the finding, basically based upon you know, how, how much consensus there is among the experts, and also the likelihood of something occurring. Uh, and there's a table in the report that shows uh, of how certain terms, uh, back to my lexicon comment, uh, relate to certain probabilities. And actuaries uh, have a duty you know, to disclose to people uh, you know, the uncertainty in the forecasts and also to cite where we have to rely on other experts. And so I think for us trying to understand how to communicate confidence and likelihood to uh, stakeholders is a critical idea. Uh, extreme events are what triggers losses which uh, affect insurance and banking and, and other financial services. <clears throat> and as the report said, there's no question that there are already significant effects on extreme events. The report uh, we showed you uh, earlier, I think in Jose's section, uh, how the um, report provides some really excellent uh, metrics on extreme events. And they do things like in this chart, you don't have to read it, it's, it's a page out of the report just to illustrate a point that you know, they talk about you know, things like 50 year events and talk about how the current 50 year event is gonna become a lot more likely in the future under various warming scenarios. And also there's gonna be a higher severity. So you must have a frequency and a severity component. And there's a wealth of information in the report talking about how various types of extreme events, be they heat waves, floods, droughts, or other, uh, or, or other serious effects are gonna be uh, different in the future. Uh, this uh, is consistent, uh, the views that are in the IPCC report with work the actuaries have done. We've had a, a series of actuaries climate index. We have one here in Australia. There's one in North America, which looks at trends in the extreme events. And these look at the trends in the, in the one or 10%, depending on which the, the one these is, of the most extreme readings of metrics like temperature, sea level, wind, and precipitation. And there's been a clear upward trend over the past 20 or 30 years in these, in these uh, extreme uh, weather events, which is consistent with what we're seeing in the IPCC report that this will continue into the future. An important concept also introduced in the, in the report that, that we really need to pay attention to is the notion of compound extreme events. And I'll give you an example here. Uh, in, in December 2021, there was a, a tornado outbreak in Kentucky in the United States that caused massive damage. And it was one of the most severe events in history, representing an abnormal combination of weather patterns. And that's been a repeating theme amongst uh, you know, places in the world, including the uh, massive Texas cold spell that brought down the power grid in the United States, unprecedented heat in Western North America. We've had floods in Europe, uh, floods in Australia here that we're currently uh, enduring. And, and so that created massive damage. Well, at the same time, uh, lumber prices, which are a key component of the rebuilding costs were uh, hitting uh, four to five times their historical average, which was uh, in part influenced by beetle infestations, droughts, and floods in timber producing regions in Canada. This occurred at the same time. So if you're an actuary uh, trying to deal with this problem, you've got to ask yourself questions like these, you know, like are these, is the likelihood of tornadoes changing? Is the cost of rebuilding being affected by lumber prices? Uh, you know, the models we're using that Yordanka uh, discussed uh, still accurate? Do we have accurate reinsurance or sorry, sufficient reinsurance and so on and so forth. And, and as the report says, that compound extremes um, are increasing and increased in likelihood since the 1950s. So we don't need to just look at one thing in, in, in isolation, but we've got to consider the entire uh, you know, risk profile, which can include multiple climate effects affecting at once. 
Another key concept that we need is to, you know, look at uh, regional effects. Uh, certainly just knowing that the global average temperature is going up by two degrees or three degrees is not particularly useful if we're trying to uh, understand the, uh, you know, likelihood of flooding in, in eastern China or uh, bushfires in Australia. So the IPCC report also has a wealth of information as it was discussed earlier on the effects regionally. We talked about the hexagons that show the uh, various uh, locations in the world and the various types of effect. The top one here is the you know, temperatures, the middle one is precipitation, the bottom one's drought. And so there's an awful lot of information in the report that can help us localize the uh, extreme, you know, our view of the extreme weather events, and 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 you know that will help us build, you know, views of you know future physical risk. Uh, when we talk about heat, that affects things like workers' compensation, mortality, morbidity. Uh, heavy precipitation can lead to floods, which obviously affect not only property insurance but loan portfolios and the value of collateral and loans. And certainly, agricultural uh, droughts affect uh, you know agricultural insurance and also political stability. I note that you know following some severe um, uh, events in Ukraine and Russia back in 2010, which affected the global wheat supply. Uh, there was uh, following poli year political instability in countries where bread prices increased dramatically. And we may be seeing a repeat of that in, in the next few years. So, so you got to look at the effect of not only climate on physical risk, but economic conditions. You know, time horizons are important. While Yodaka did talk about short term time horizons of three to five years, actually, many in our industry work with <clears throat> much longer time horizons. When we consider strategic issues like product design, you know, do we need to design, uh, you know, products for electric vehicles? Do we need to understand um, how we're going to have to uh, cover, uh, you know, risks in areas subject to rising sea levels or different stresses? You know, this can extend out to perhaps 20 years. You certainly got banks and um, other lenders that have loans for 30 years and certainly pension systems, et cetera, have investments that can span generations. Uh, when considering these you know, uh, near-term changes, <clears throat> it's also important to consider natural climate variability, which is discussed in the report. You've got things like internal uh, variability, which includes things like El Nino, the IOD, which affects bushfires in Australia, or the uh, Atlantic multi-decadal variability, which affects hurricanes in the North Atlantic. And you've also got things like external natural variability, like, um, like volcanoes, etc. And, and certainly, uh, while extremes will scale with global warming, uh, natural variability uh, will modify those changes over shorter time horizons and particularly at regional scales. So we also need to consider, you know, how the warming climate will interact with these drivers uh, like El Nino, uh, Southern Oscillation, which drive uh, insurance losses. Uh, a couple of other key points that come out of the summary that affect our work include that you know the temperatures uh, is very helpful for certain perils like rainfall, heat, and drought. Uh, but importantly, as was mentioned earlier, mitigation efforts are not going to have a great deal of effect on most things until uh, 2050. Uh, so even if we cut emissions today uh, dramatically and lower them over the next several decades, the the results in 2050 to some extent are baked in, but there'll be massive in, you know changes by 2100. And some effects like rising sea levels occur gradually, but uh, past emissions have already locked us into things like rising sea levels over the next several centuries. So uh, to sort of conclude my bit, um, you know, when we think about building scenarios, uh, this is really all about supplementing historical data. You know, the history, what we used to do, which was look at the past to project the future, is no longer a good way for us to understand extreme events that drive uh, losses to, say, property insurance. So, in order to do that, we've got to understand first the representative concentration pathways, which really affect, which really discuss, you know, how emissions are going to affect warming. Uh, we've got to think about time horizons. We've got to understand then how that, you know, global view down downscales to local uh, weather in, in regions of countries. 
We've then got to consider the uh, you know, socioeconomic pathways, uh, which will include things like decarbonization affected by economic changes and uh, you know, uh, political decisions, et cetera. And certainly as we talk about um, the, the risks, there's certainly transition risk and physical risk. And I saw a question earlier on that point. And, and, and a key point is that the time horizons differ for physical risk, which is things like damage to building versus transition risks, which are things like the uh, effects of uh, decarbonization on economic activity and uh, employment and, and other things. And, and a key point is that physical risk is generally slower and gradual where transition risk can be abrupt and subject to reversals. So, you know, transition, you know, there can be a carbon tax put on tomorrow that creates quite a bit of economic disruption that may not lower, uh, uh, you know, that may not uh, have an effect on lowering the uh, likelihood of extreme weather for decades. And that's the core of reason why there's political resistance to tackling the climate problem. And certainly geographic scope's important physical risk, uh, you know, really affects global uh, patterns. You know, that you're, you're really thinking about global emissions that are driving physical risk, whereas transition is due to government policies at the local level. Um, the regulators are driving this. I'll just briefly touch on what's happening in Australia. The regulator here of financial institutions is mandating uh, significant disclosures for climate. Uh, they talk about, you know, the various types of risks and the best practice management. They've also got something called a climate vulnerability assessment, which is compelling uh, banks to, for example, do uh, physical risk assessments on loan portfolios, et cetera, and actually quantifying the risk in, in, in portfolios uh, using sophisticated tools, which I'll cover in the next slide. And uh, while regulatory conditions are important, um, you know, people should be dealing with climate risk not as a compliance exercise, but as a way to strengthen a firm's ability to um, pro thrive and prosper uh, in the future. So when we talk about how, like example, we would estimate future climate risk in a, in a um, asset portfolio, for example, um, we would first, you know, review the science, we would then uh, construct scenarios uh, using tools like the uh, information in the IPCC Summary for Actuaries Report and in the Interactive Atlas. We would then use that to inform uh, models like Yodanka, talk, Yodanka talked about that basically estimate losses to insurance portfolios or loans. You would then use that to um, put a monetary value, such as an average annual loss or an insurance premium on the, on the uh, impact on various properties, and then summarize that at some reasonable level, like a portfolio of loans or all of the homes in a state or whatever, to try to understand the uh, susceptibility of a portfolio to, um, to risk. Uh, there's some excellent information summaries in the back of the uh, report, which show things like this, which is changes in climate drivers. Uh, this is one that basically shows various things like hot and cold, wind, you know, uh, snow and ice, et cetera. And then how various regions are affected by these things using color coding and, uh, and other things in the charts, which is again, very useful to help communicate to stakeholders what's driving the losses that may affect those um, estimates that we put together. So um, I, I guess to kind of finish up, I'd, I'd like to just make a couple of points. First of all, you know, what are our clients need in climate? I think you know, they need education, they need assistance with trying to deal with the tsunami of information that people like our friends at the IPCC are putting out. They need ways to assess the physical risk to things like buildings from, from changed weather patterns. They need to understand transition risk of, of decarbonizing the economy. They've got to put these things in their risk management framework. They've got to uh, report that out to stakeholders and communicate all this. They are going to have to measure their own emissions in order to go on the journey to net zero. And then they're going to have to have strategies for product design, pricing, et cetera. You know, actuaries have much to offer in, how, in terms of managing this risk. And we're glad to be part of the team of uh, experts who are trying to help uh, 
all sorts of stakeholders deal with these very serious social problems. That's gonna require us to develop new skills and techniques and develop continuing education, education programs from our uh, actuarial organizations. We really hope to collaborate further with people like the IPCC and to be able to tackle the challenges, but take advantage of the opportunities ahead. There's more information on the IAA's website. There'll be a copy of this distributed. We've got a place called Publications Papers on Climate Risk, which has a number of our papers. We have a webinar coming up on 26th of April on one of our papers. Uh, there's my contact information. Feel free to send me an email if you'd like some information. And uh, with that, we'll take questions and discussions. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Ray. Uh, now, contrary to what I said at the start of the webinar, we are not unmuting you because uh, time is uh, a little bit uh, not on our side. So if you have to go, please go, but uh, we will have a, a, a few minutes of overrun. So, uh, and we have received a plenty of questions uh, through the uh, uh, through the Q&A or the chat uh, uh, feature. So um, firstly, perhaps I would ask one question uh, from Sarah, if I may. Uh, so one of the questions was, are there any working parties which are researching the topics raised today and how would I go about joining? So uh, as far as the IPCC is concerned, uh, Sarah, can you explain how one can uh, relate uh, themselves to, to the work of the IPCC and in particular working of one uh, technical support unit or... Uh, yeah. Of course, I'm happy to, and I'm sure Valerie might want to compliment me as, as well. But um, so in terms of the IPCC as an organization, we don't actually conduct our own research from scratch. We're um, an organization that draws on scientists, hundreds of scientists from across the world who are based in different institutions or their practitioners, their researchers who do the, the research themselves. And they come together to review all the scientific literature to produce the IPCC reports um, and so we really build on the the development of, from the community themselves uh, of, of the the science that's there um, but in terms of becoming an author for an IPCC report we have specific IPCC cycles that happen every roughly eight, eight to ten years and so if you want to become uh, an author for the next IPCC cycle which will be starting um, in a few years time I would think um, you have to put yourself forward um, to be uh, nominated and selected. And you can find out information on the IPCC website um, through how you can uh, nominate yourself. You have to do it through your country's focal point. I'll put a link in the, the chat about that. Valerie, oh, did thank. you want to compliment me at all for that? Yeah, that, thank you. Uh, if, if you uh, uh, my answer to, to an actually, if an actually wants to be active on this, uh, the first place is, is their own home association. I'm pretty sure that uh, many of our uh, bigger associations uh, have a, a special uh, task force or working group on climate change, climate risk. Uh, the IA has a, a number of special sections uh, that consist of individual members, uh, and these sections uh, carry out uh, research and, and publications. They, they do publications, and I just uh, happened to read that uh, our non-life uh, uh, section, which is called Astin, has just announced a, a series of master class uh, uh, master classes where climate change and climate risk will be one of the topics. So you may want to join one of these sections that are involved in uh, climate uh, uh, risk, or you can uh, uh, join your member associations, uh, climate-related uh, working party, whatever, and through that you can. Uh, 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 relate your work with uh, uh, the Climate Risk Task Force. It has a, a, a liaison group. Uh, the liaisons uh, are, are uh, uh, connecting points to the member associations. So um, uh, I, I'm not sure. Uh, uh, I, I understood that uh, Valerie has uh, given some answers uh, to, to the questions uh, raised to her. But Valerie, if you would like to uh, focus on on perhaps the most uh, interesting uh, question to you. Would you go ahead, please? There was a, a question about uh, tipping points. 
And yes. I would like to flag that. So we know that there can be some specific aspects in the climate system associated with tipping points, ice sheets, um, the, the deep Atlantic Ocean circulation, forests, um, such aspects. And uh, it, is, it is a matter of ongoing research activities. I've illustrated how it's approached in the report with the sea level projections, where with a dashed line, we show a storyline, you know, if uh, in a high end scenarios, um, ice sheet collapse is triggered, this is currently associated with deep uncertainty, then this would be the quantitative outcome. And this approach of storylines is also used for um, high warming storylines, you know, for a given emission pathway, if the response of the climate system is in the upper end, then what would be the outcomes? And it's also approached for, um, in the case of uh, a collapse of the Atlantic meridional circulation, uh, then what would be the implications? Um, we still have uh, uh, uncertainties on the exact uh, uh, global warming levels that would lead to such possible outcomes. Uh, but what we know is that uh, with faster and higher warming rates, it makes them less improbable in a way. Um, and uh, regarding the other question, um, if you have specific needs that uh, you think are not well addressed in the current IPCC reports, it could be the right time to formulate uh, um, expectations, for instance, as an observing organization to IPCC, and it's really timely to shape uh, what could be some of the key aspects of the next cycle. Um, the next special report, it has already been decided, will be focused on cities and climate change. And I think that's really critical, given that cities um, together uh, represent about two thirds of global greenhouse gas emissions. They concentrate assets, infrastructures. Um, they are strong inter interplays between aspects related to health, well being in cities. And, and climate related implications. So if you have specific uh, suggestions, it can be timely to uh, express yourself as an observing organization, for instance, to the IPCC ahead of the um, next cycle that will uh, start next year. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, there was another question uh, uh, addressed to your Dank, I guess, that given the rising losses that Swiss, re Swiss re is seeing, uh, what will determine whether these are events that are no longer insurer, insurable. So how do you see wh whether or not uh, certain events uh, will uh, still be insurable or non-insurable? Yeah, oh, uh, sorry. Your donk is good, right? I, I was going to take okay. that one. Okay, okay. okay. go ahead, Reid. Yeah, I, I, go and ahead, I, and I might touch on one or two of the other questions too quickly. Um, uh, look, I, I think that a couple things I've known, you know, I remember after 9-11 when the terrorism market collapsed and nobody thought we'd ever be able to insure terrorism. And now, um, you know, this relatively bustling market years later, once we've put in new tools, adaptation measures, uh, you know, and things like that. And and I do think that if you, you look at the the adaptation activities that are occurring and, you know, you, you look at uh, a lot of the building code improvements, et cetera. I, I do believe that things will continue to be insurable relatively indefinitely. Uh, there's no question that certain parts of the world like sea, you know, beachfront property and places that are gonna become washed away by rising sea levels are gonna be problematic, but I, I don't believe we're gonna see just a complete, you know, uninsurability problem across you know, massive areas of the world, though things are going to become more expensive. And if we don't invest in either mitigating emissions or adapting our building codes, we're going to have very expensive problems in the future. And I just I wanted to react to one other comment as, as to why we didn't touch as much, you know, life and health and other things. Uh, just in the limited amount of time, I think a couple of us kind of chose to, you know, focus on things like property insurance, because it's a fairly you know, clear place where the climate affects things, but there's the in the IAA papers, there's there's plenty of discussion of uh, life and health and um, and other uh, pension aspects of, of this problem because it certainly affects all aspects of the of the financial system that we operate in. Thank you, Ray. So, unfortunately, due to time constraints, we we need to close this webinar, but. Um, the secretary of the IA will save the the uh, 
um, uh, chat uh, uh, messages and the uh, questions, and we will try to arrange for an appropriate uh, uh, response to each uh, question uh, and and send them to uh, to the uh, 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 participants of the meeting uh, in one form or the other, maybe on the IA website. So thank you very much for joining this uh, webinar, and thank you, Sarah. Uh, Jordanka, Raid, uh, Valerie, and Jose for contributing. Uh, I think it's been a, a very interesting and very dense uh, uh, webinar, very useful, and uh, the I will continue uh, to provide similar sessions, but I encourage everybody uh, who participated to actually read the summary for actuaries because it's a, it's a massive document and actuaries and non-actuaries can read can learn a lot about that so with that uh, uh again one one more comment so uh, there were many questions about whether or not you will have access to the presentations yes you will have access to the presentation and the recording on the ia website so check the ia website from time to time for useful uh updates on on information that uh, has been given today or the ipcc website again and uh, you can trust that uh, we will continue uh, these uh, activities, uh, hopefully jointly with the IPCC. Uh, and I'm not sure, Sarah, you want to say something as, as a closing, very closing remark? Just thank you everyone for joining and hopefully it's useful for everyone. Thanks. Very good. <laughs> thank you very much. Uh, have a, a nice further day. Good night to, to some uh, and see you next time. Goodbye. <laughs>